In this video lesson, we'll be discussing the religious reform movements of the 1800s. Church attendance was still a regular ritual for about three-fourths of the 23 million Americans in 1850. Religion of these years was not an old-time religion of colonial days. The austere Calvinist rigor had long been seeping out of the American church. The rationalist ideas of the French Revolutionary era had done much to soften orthodoxy. Many of the founding fathers, including Jefferson and Franklin, embraced the liberal doctrines of deism that Thomas Paine promoted in his book, The Age of Reason. Deistry relied on reason rather than revelation, on science rather than the Bible. They rejected the concept of original sin and denied Christ's divinity, yet deists believed in a supreme being who created a knowable universe and humans and moral behavior. Deism helped to inspire an important spin-off from the severe Puritanism of the past. The Unitarian faith, which began to gather momentum in the Northeast at the end of the 18th century. Unitarians held that God existed in only one person and not in the Orthodox Trinity. Although the denying the deity of Jesus, Unitarians stressed the essential goodness of human nature rather than its vileness and believed in free will and salvation through good works. They pictured God not as a stern creator, but as a loving father. And the Unitarian movement appealed mostly to intellectuals whose rationalism and optimism contrasted sharply with the hellfire doctrines of Calvinism, which believed in predestination and depravity. A boiling reaction against the growing liberalism in religion set in about 1800. A fresh wave of roaring revivals, beginning on the southern frontier but soon rolling even into the cities of the Northeast, sent what was called the Second Great Awakening surging ahead. Seeping up even more people than the First Great Awakening, the Second Great Awakening was one of the most momentous episodes in the history of American religion. A tidal wave of spiritual fervor left converted souls, many shattered and reorganized churches, and numerous new sects. It also encouraged an effervescent evangelicalism that bubbled up into innumerable areas of American life, such as prison reform, the temperance movement, the women's movement, and the crusade to abolish slavery. You can see a picture or representation here of a religious camp meeting or a revival um, that was common during the Second Great Awakening and the 1800s. The Second Great Awakening was spread to the masses on the frontier by huge camp meetings, as you saw previously in the picture. As many as 25,000 people would gather for an encampment of several days to drink the hellfire gospel as served by an itinerant preacher. Revivals boosted church membership and stimulated a variety of humanitarian reforms, including missionary work. Methodists and Baptists reaped the most abundant harvest of souls from the fields fertilized by revivalism. Both sects stre stressed personal conversion, a relatively democratic control of church affairs, a rousing emotionalism as well. Powerful Peter Cartwright was the best known of the Methodist circuit riders or traveling frontier preachers. Charles Grandison Finney, shown here in this picture, was also one of the greatest of the revival preachers. Finney abandoned being a lawyer to become an evangelist after a conversion experience as a young man. Finney held huge crowds spellbound with the power of his oratory and the pungency of his message. He led massive revivals in Rochester and in New York City in 1830 and 1831. He devised the anxious bench where repentant sinners could sit in full view of the congregation, and he encouraged women to pray aloud in public. A key feature of the Second Great Awakening was the feminization of religion, both in terms of church membership and theology. The middle-class women were the first and most fervent enthusiasts of the religious revivalism, and they became the majority of the new church members. Evangelicals preached a gospel of female spiritual worth and offered women an active role in bringing their husbands and their families back to God. 
That being accomplished, many women turned to saving the rest of society, which epitomized the era's ambitious reforms. Revivals also furthered the fragmentation of religious faiths. Western New York, where descendants of Northeastern Puritans had settled, came to be known as the Burned Over District. Millerites, or Adventists, who had several hundred thousand adherents, rose from the superheated soil of the burned over region in the 1830s. Named after William Miller, they interpreted the Bible to mean that Christ would return to earth on October 22, 1844. The failure of Jesus to descend on schedule dampened but did not destroy the movement. Like the First Great Awakening, the Second Great Awakening tended to widen the lines between classes and regions. More prosperous and conservative de denominations in the East were little touched by revivalism, and Episcopalians, Presbyterians, Congregationalists, and Unitarians continued to rise mostly from wealthier, better educated levels of society. This is the Millerite prophetic time chart from 1843 that detailed the prophecies of Daniel and the book of Revelation. Methodists, Baptists, and other new sects spawned from swelling evangelic fervor and tended to come from less prosperous, less learned communities in the rural South and in the West. Religious diversity further reflected social cleavages when the churches faced up to the slavery issue. By 1844 and 1845, both the Southern Baptists and the Southern Methodists had split over the, with their northern brethren, brethren excuse me, over the human bondage. The succession of the southern churches foreshadowed the secession of the southern states. The smoldering spiritual embers of the burned over district kindled Joseph Smith, who was a rugged visionary, who reported that he had received some golden plates from an angel. When deciphered, they constituted the Book of Mormon, and the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints was launched. After establishing a religious oligarchy, Smith ran into serious opposition from his non-Mormon neighbors, first in Ohio and then in Missouri and Illinois. His cooperative sect rasped rank-and-file Americans who were individualistic and dedicated to free enterprise. The Mormons aroused further antagonism by voting as a unit and by and by openly but understandably drilling their militia for defensive purposes. Accusations of polygamy likewise arose and increased in intensity. Continuing hostility finally drove the Mormons to desperate measures. In 1844, Joseph Smith and his brother were murdered and mangled by a mob in Carthage, Illinois, and the movement seemed near collapse the failing torch was seized by a man named Brigham Young. Brigham Young quickly proved to be an aggressive leader, an eloquent preacher, and a gifted administrator. He was determined to escape further religious persecution, so Young, in 1846 to 1847, led his oppressed and despoiled Latter-day Saints over the rolling plains to Utah. Overcoming pioneer hardships, the Mormons soon made the desert bloom like a new Eden by means of ingenious and cooperative methods of irrigation. Semi-arid Utah grew remarkably. By the end of 1848, some 5,000 settlers had arrived and other large bands were to follow them. Many dedicated Mormons in the 1850s actually made the 1,300-mile trek across the plains by pulling carts. Under the rigidly disciplined management of Brigham Young, who can be seen here in this picture, the community became a prosperous frontier theocracy with a cooperative commonwealth. Young married as many as 27 women, and populations were further swelled by thousands of immigrants from Europe, where the Mormons had established a missionary movement. A crisis developed when Washington government was unable to control the hierarchy of Brigham Young who had been made territorial governor in 1850. A federal army marched in 1857 against the Mormons, but the quarrel was finally adjusted without war and violence. We'll discuss more the religious revivals and reform movements of the 1800s in class.